Can we upset more people a little bit? You already I you, uh, maybe we'd have to try. No, no. Can we uh can I ask you <laughs> to elaborate because I my intuition was that you would be a supporter of something like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin because it is oh. fundamentally emphasizes decentralization. <laughs> what do you th- so so can you elaborate <laughs> on yeah. when, <laughs> okay, look, your thoughts um, on Bitcoin? I um it's kind of funny. Um I I wrote a, I I've been advocating some kind of digital currency for a long time, mm-hmm. and when the the uh, when the, when Bitcoin came out and the original paper on on blockchain, um, my heart kind of sank because I thought, oh my God, we're we're applying all of this fancy thought and all these very careful distributed security measures to recreate the gold standard. Like, it's just so retro, it's so dysfunctional, yeah. it's so useless from an economic point of view. So it's always, ama- and then the other thing is using computational inefficiency at a boundless scale as your form of security is a crime against the atmosphere, obviously. A lot of people know that now, but we knew that at the start. Like, the thing is, when the first paper came out, I remember a lot of people saying, oh my God, this, this thing scales, it's a carbon yeah. disaster, you know? And, and... um I, I just like I'm just mystified, but that that's a different question than when you asked. Can you have um, a cryptographic currency or at least some kind of digital currency that's of a benefit? And absolutely, like I'm, and there are people who are trying to be thoughtful about this. You should, uh, if you haven't, you should interview uh, Vitalik Buterin sometime. Yeah, there, there I interviewed him twice. <laughs> okay, so like there are people in the community who are trying to be thoughtful and trying to figure out how to do this better. Yeah. It has nice properties, though, right? So the one of the nice properties uh-huh. is that like government centralized, it's hard to control. Uh, and then the other one to fix some of the issues that you're referring to. I'm sort of playing devil's mm-hmm. advocate here. Is you know there's Lightning Network. There's ideas how to how you uh, build stuff on top of Bitcoin, similar with gold, that allow you to have this kind of vibrant economy that operates not on the blockchain, but outside the blockchain and uses uh, Bitcoin for uh, for like checking the security of those transactions. Mm, so Bitcoin's not new, it's been around for a yes. while. I've been watching it closely. I've, ne- I've not seen one e- example of it creating economic growth. There was this obsession with the idea that government was the problem. That idea that government's the problem, let's say government earned that wrath honestly. Uh, because <laughs> if you look at some of the things that governments have done in recent decades, it's not a pretty story. Mm-hmm. Like uh, after uh, after a very small number of people in the U.S. government decided to bomb and landmine Southeast Asia, it's hard to come back and say, oh, government's this great thing. But uh, then the problem is that this resistance to government is basically a resistance to politics. It's a way of saying... If I can get rich, nobody should bother me. It's a way of not of not having obligations to others, and that ultimately is a very suspect motivation. But does that mean that the impulse that the government um, should not overreach its power is flawed? Well, I mean, what I want to ask you to do is to replace the word government with politics, like our. Politics is people having to deal with each other. Yes. My theory about freedom is that the only authentic form of freedom is perpetual annoyance. That, all right. So <laughs> annoyance means you're actually dealing with people because people are annoying. Perpetual yeah. means that that annoyance is survivable so it doesn't destroy yeah. us all. So if you have perpetual annoyance, then you have freedom. If and you that's don't, politics. That's politics. If you don't have perpetual annoyance, something's gone very wrong and you've suppressed those people and it's only temporary, it's going to come back and be horrible. You should seek perpetual annoyance. I'll invite you to a Berkeley City Council meeting so you can know what that feels like. What perpetual annoyance feels like. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so freedom is being, the, the test of freedom is that you're annoyed by other people. If you're not, you're not free. If you're not, you're trapped in some temporary illusion that's going to fall apart. Now, um, the, this quest to avoid government is really a quest to avoid that political feeling, but you have to have it. You have to deal with it. Um, and it sucks, but that's the, con- the human situation. That's the human condition. And this idea that we're going to have this abstract thing that protects us from having to deal with each other is always an illusion. The idea, and I, I apologize, I'm uh, overstretched the use of the word government. The idea is there should be some punishment from the people when a group, um, when a bureaucracy, when a set of when a set of people or a particular leader, like in an authoritarian regime, which 
more than half the world currently lives under if you mm. uh, like if they become they start stop representing the people it stops being like a berkeley uh meeting and starts being more like a, a like a dictatorial kind of uh, mm -hmm. situation and so the point is it it's nice to give people uh the populace in, in decentralized way power to um resist that kind of uh like government becoming over authoritarian. yeah but people see this idea that the problem is always the government being powerful is false uh, the problem can also be criminal gangs. The problem can also be weird cults. The problem can be abusive, uh, abusive clergy. The problem can be uh, yeah. uh, infrastructure that fails. The problem can be uh, poisoned water. The problem can be failed electric grids. The problem can be um, uh, a crappy education system yeah. that makes this the whole society uh, less and less able to to create value. There are all these other problems that are different from an overbearing government. Like you have to keep some sense of perspective and not be obsessed with only one kind of problem because then the others will pop up. But, but, but empirically speaking, some problems are bigger than others. So like some uh, like uh, groups of people, like governments or gangs or Has, companies lead to problems. Are you, more are you a US citizen? Yes. Has the government ever really been a problem for you? Well, okay. So first of all, I grew up in the Soviet Union. Used to, used to, well, and actually, yeah, my so, wife did too. So, I, yeah. So I, I, that, I have, I have seen, you know, yeah. um, sure. Uh, and has the government bothered me? I would say that uh, that's that's a really complicated question, especially because the United States is such it's a special place, you know, like like a, like a lot of other countries. But my they, wife's family were refuseniks, and so we have like a very and. Uh, her dad was sent to the gulag. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, on my father's side, all but a few were killed by a pogrom in in uh, uh, post-Soviet pogrom in Ukraine. So, so I, 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 I would I'm, say because because you did a yeah. little trick of uh, eloquent trick of language that you switched to the United States to talk about government. So I am I'm I believe unlike my friend Michael Malice, who's an anarchist. I believe <laughs> government can do a lot of good in the world. That is exactly what you're saying, which is it's it's politics. The thing that Bitcoin folks and cryptocurrency folks argue is that one of the big ways that government uh -huh. can control the populace is a centralized bank, like control the, the, the money. That was the case in the Soviet Union too. There's, you know, uh, inflation is, can really make poor people suffer. And so th what they argue is, this is one way to go around that power that government has uh, of controlling the monetary system. So that's a way to resist. That's not actually saying government bad. That's saying some of the ways that uh, central banks get into trouble can be right. resisted through decentralized. So, so let me ask you on balance today in the real world, in terms of actual facts, do you think cryptocurrencies are doing more to prop up corrupt, murderous, horrible regimes or to resist those regimes? Where do you think the balance is right now? I, I know exactly, uh, having talked to a lot of cryptocurrency folks, what they would tell me, right? I, it's hard. It's, I don't, it, no, no. no, <laughs> no I, it's, I'm asking it as a real question. I don't, I, there's no I, way I, to know the answer perfectly. There's no way to however, know the answer perfectly. However, I got to say, uh, if you look at, people who've been able to decode uh, blockchains, and they, they do leak a lot of data. They're not as secure as is widely thought. There are a lot of unknown uh, Bitcoin whales from pretty early, and they're huge. And if you ask, who are these people? Um, there's evidence that a lot of them are quite un not the people you'd want to support, let's say. And I, I just don't... Like, I think empirically, this idea that there's some intrinsic way that bad governments will be will, will, will be disempowered and people will be able to resist, the, resist them more than new villains or even villainous governments will be empowered. There's no basis for that assertion. It, it just is kind of circumstantial. And uh, I think in general, Bitcoin ownership is one thing, but Bitcoin transactions have tended to support criminality more than productivity. Of course, they would argue that was that was the story of its early days. That now more and more uh, Bitcoin is being used for 
uh, legitimate transactions. But that's the difference. I didn't say for legitimate transactions. I said for economic growth, for for creativity. Like, sure. um, I uh, I think what's happening is people are using it a little bit for for buying. I don't know. Maybe somebody's companies make it available for this and that. They buy a Tesla with it or something. Yeah. Um, investing in a startup hard. It might have happened a little bit, but it's it's not an engine of productivity, creativity, and economic growth. Sure. Uh, whereas old fashioned currency still is. So and uh, anyway, I'm look, I think something I'm I'm pro the idea of digital currencies. Sure. I am anti the idea of economics wiping out politics as a result. <laughs> I think they have to exist in some balance to avoid the worst dysfunctions of each. In some ways there's parallels to our discussion of algorithms and cryptocurrency is you're pro the idea, but it can be used uh, to manipulate. You can use be used poorly by uh, aforementioned humans. Well, I think that you can make better designs and worse designs. Sure. And I think, and you know, the thing about cryptocurrency that's so interesting is how many of us are responsible for the poor designs because we're all so hooked on that Horatio Alger story, on like, I'm going to be the one who gets the viral benefit. You know, yeah. way, way back when all this stuff was starting, I remember it would have been in the 80s, somebody had the idea of using viral as a metaphor for network effect. Mm -hmm. And the whole point was to talk about how bad network effect was, that it always created distortions that ruined the the usefulness of economic incentives, that that created dangerous distortions. Like, but then somehow, even after the pandemic, we think of viral as this good thing because we imagine ourselves as the virus, right? We want to be on the on the beneficiary side of it. But of course, you're not likely to be. There is a sense because money is involved, people are not reasoning uh clearly always because they want to be they want to be part of that first viral wave that makes them rich. And that blinds people from their basic morality. I had an interesting conversation. I don't, uh, I sort of feel like I should respect some people's privacy, but some of the initial people who started uh, Bitcoin, I, I remember having an argument about like, it's intrinsically a Ponzi scheme. Like, you know, the early people have more than the later people. And the further down the chain you get, the more you're subject to gambling-like dynamics, where it's more and more random and more and more subject to weird network effects and whatnot unless you're a very small player, uh, perhaps, and you're just buying something. But even then you'll be subject to fluctuations because the whole thing is just kind of, it, like the, as it fluctuates, it's gonna wave around the little people more. And, um, they, and I remember the conversation turned to gambling because gambling is a pretty large economic sector. And it's always struck me as being non-productive. Like somebody goes to Las Vegas and they lose money. And so, one argument is, well, they got entertainment. They paid for entertainment as they lost money, so that's fine. And the and Las Vegas does up the losing of money in an entertaining way, so why not? It's like going to a show. So that's one argument. The argument that was made to me was different from that. It's that, no, what they're doing is they're getting a chance to experience hope. And a lot of people don't get that chance, and so that's really worth it, even if they're going to lose. They have that moment of hope, and they need to be able to experience that. And it's a very interesting argument. Um, oh, that's so heartbreaking because I, uh, I've well, seen, I've the, seen, but I've seen that way. Like that, I have that a little bit of a sense. I've, I've talked to some young people who invest in, in cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. and it, it, what I see is this hope. This is the first thing that gave them hope, and that's so heartbreaking to me that you've gotten hope from the so much is invested. It's like hope from somehow becoming rich, as opposed to something to me. I apologize, but money is in the long term not going to be a source of that deep meaning. It's good to have enough money, but it should not be the source of hope. Mm -hmm. And it's heartbreaking to me how many people it's the source of hope. Yeah. Um, you've just described the psychology of virality or the psychology of, of trying to base a civilization on semi-random occurrences of network effect peaks. 